Hi. How, how are you? Good. How are you doing? All right. I've got four stage cancer. Oh my God. I'm sorry. I didn't know that. That's not your fault. <laughs> no, but um. <laughs> well, I pre I appreciate you. My, my standard reaction to that. <laughs> yeah. It's a good. It's a good reaction. It's a good one. Yeah. I, humor is the key to survival. You know that. <laughs> Ex exactly. Exactly. Well, well, thank you for for car. This this is unexpected. I didn't I didn't. Uh, thank you for responding like this. Okay, let me take you off of here. Well, I'm, I'm here just laid up and um, got some time. It's just on my hands, so I figured I'd give you a call because oh, there's I obviously you probably know there's a huge divide in what the remaining survivors of the pranksters are about. Yeah. The uh, the Wikipedia story is just simply untrue. Yeah. Well, I know that now. Now that I've heard your story, I I'm really questioning the the official story. Well, you know, the thing is, the officials you understand something that there was a huge movement to discredit the leaders of the '60s. Yeah. By the government. Oh yeah. You know. Oh, I know. <laughs> so, and so, so to make Neil a, a bum on the railroad tracks, counting railroad ties, is pretty much the way they'd like his legacy to be. Wow. Wow, that's that's a motivation I hadn't even considered, and wow, wow. See, the thing is, is that Neil was well. Neil gave me my my prankster name. He called me Merlin, and uh, because I was a pantomime who worked in the fourth dimension, perfect candidate for psychedelics, of course. <laughs> uh, and the the whole the whole the whole thing is is that Neil was. The Mercury, the messenger of the pranksters. He was the guy who put people together. Aldous Huxley, Lenny Bruce, all the people that he wanted us to meet. He basically instigated 99% of that. Wow. So, and that's something no one's ever written about him, you know? That, see, that's bizarre. Yeah, no, that sounds like a big part of the story. I, I'm surprised it. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, what? I mean, and, so, go ahead. No, yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, I mean, see, I didn't, the thing you said about the, the government, I, I've been doing a, a lot of research on this because I was given, I was born on a, an army base and when I was a, an infant, like right after birth, I was given high, high doses of fluoride. My mother was given a little thing of serum to give me every day and then when I was old enough to take pills, I was taking fluoride pills and these pills affected me. I mean, this is my, can you hear that? that that's what my spine does all day, every day. But the, the thing was, it was on a military base and none of the other peers from my age group ever were given that fluoride except for my soulmate who I met about 20 years ago. She was also born on a military base. She was also given the serum she was also had all kinds of bone problems. She was in a wheelchair because her bones didn't, when she was a kid, because her bones didn't uh, form right. And then she died of cancer when she was 34, 14 years ago. Wow. What so kind of cancer did she have? It was breast cancer that went immediately into her bones, which... That's where mine is right now. Oh, really? That's mine. So I know, yeah. what, that, I know the pain you're going through because that's, I know how much that hurts. Yeah, I mean, I could outlive the cancer, frankly, but the pain is a whole other matter. Yeah, that's same with her, yeah. So, you know, uh, but I've already led two or three lifetimes. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's, yeah, no, that's... I'm grateful for what I got here and now. I live on a boat. I'm in paradise, really. Nice. That's... And, you know, um, I'm thankful. The only regret I have is the friends and family and that I'm leaving behind, you know, because... I know they're gonna miss me. Yeah, of course. I mean, you. I mean, t just to have been. I mean, I, I didn't know that anyone had. I'm, I'm telling. I'm still absorbing your story because I I saw it last night, and I'm just. I, I, I'm gonna give you a full full disclosure here because most people think this is the crazy part of my story. Since I first my first copy of On the Road, 
that picture, that infamous picture on, on the cover of, of Neil and Jack, uh, where, uh -huh. where Neil's head is like this, he's like cracking his neck. From yeah. that moment through right now in this conversation, I have believed in my heart of hearts, in my soul, that I am him reincarnated. Really? And I know that sounds crazy, and I know it sounds... No, 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 I believe in reincarnation, it's possible. I, 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 I believe, I do too, and it's actually, science has been starting to prove, uh, there, there's, there's actually researchers at the university level who have been studying kids who have memories of past lives, and like right. scientifically studying, that they, like we'll show a picture, the, these kids, an array of pictures, and they'll pick out things from that past life that are the correct answer. So, I mean, there's scientific, but, but I mean, I took it, I've taken it pretty far. Like I reached out to Carolyn uh -huh. many, many years ago and she didn't want anything to do with it, but Jamie and I corresponded for a while, which, uh -huh. which was, I mean, I, I, to this day, I'm not sure I did the right thing because it was, I know it caused the family a little grief because the rest of the family is like, come on, he's just some crazy guy. When I first... Well, they, they, actually, probably, you're probably the 30th person that said this to me. Well, that, that's, yeah. weird, that's weird that you say that because um, uh, 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 Zane Casey said that as well, that you know a do dozen people have, re have said they were him reincarnated. But when I originally reached out to the, the Cassidy family, they said no one had ever reached out to them like that before, which I found weird. Like I thought the story would be all kinds of people saying I'm him reincarnated. So when I first reached out to the Cassidy's, they're like, no one's ever even claimed that before, which I thought was just strange. And now apparently, like I said, Zane, Zane said the same thing. Oh, a dozen people have claimed that. And I'm not, I'm, I mean, I have no. Don't pay attention to anything Zane says. <laughs> well, I've 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 come to realize that. Um, yeah, no, I mean it's it's tough growing up in the shadow of a genius. But, exactly, and I see uh, that in him. Like I, I I see him as yeah. a second generation. You know, he was he was given the silver spoon. He has not. He didn't earn what his father earned. You know, so I right. get that. Yeah. But I, 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 I don't know. I just, it's, it's almost, I don't want to say it's haunted me, but it, it kind of has affected my life. Like I, after, uh, in college, I gathered, I, I like kind of fell into this group of like crazy genius, creative people. And I felt like it was my job to be the motivator of them. Like I've kind of played the Neil Cassidy role in and it's not, and it's weird because I don't, it, I don't claim to have a single memory of his life. It's not like I have any memory of being that person in a previous life. I just, like I said, from the moment I saw that picture in every instant since, I just feel like that's what it is. So let me ask you a question. Yeah, yeah. Does my face look familiar? To <laughs> well, I'm going to be honest with you. It, it, I feel. I feel a connection. I mean, this feels like, but you just also, you look like a kind, so I'm going to grab some water here. You look like just a, you know, a kind, gentle person. So, I mean, it, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Do I look familiar? <laughs> Did you? No, not you don't, but I mean, you know, I, Neil and I were very tight. Yeah. Very, I, very tight. Yeah. He was very verbose and I was quiet. I was a pantomime. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. per perfect couple. <laughs> Exactly. He would do the expounding and I would do the imagery. <laughs> nice. That's nice. <laughs> so we were very, very tight. And um, back when he came came down to Mexico with Walker, uh, and Walker will verify this, that he dropped him off in Puerto Vallarta, um, even though Walker disagrees with my story entirely. Oh, really? He, we, the one thing that we found really... Um, coincidental uh -huh. in quotes was that Neil was extremely quiet and introverted at the time which kind of that's a red flag right there it was like he he was truly a psychic I mean yeah when you talk with Neil or try to talk with Neil um, you know you try to get a question in an edgewise in his ongoing monologue and he'd answer the damn question before you got to ask it <laughs> So he was definitely 
a sidekick. <laughs> and I heard about the uh, be, the knowing the, the numbers off of dollar bills. Right. No, I mean he was he was an amazing human being. Uh, Kerouac said of him uh, that he would have been the great American novelist had he stood still long enough to write the book. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah, and I and I saw an interview with Carolyn yesterday last night when I was watching more videos, and she said something about when he wrote the first third, she referred to it as when he still could, like he couldn't. Right. Yeah, like that was. It was, you know, I mean, if anyone was hip enough to record anything he was saying, um, you know, that that stuff is out there in the archives yeah. of the world. Yeah. Um, but um, but Neil Neil came, and I had just been got out of Mexican prison for three joints. Jesus Christ. <laughs> so I had I had plenty to tell him, <laughs> shall we say. So even though he was very quiet and introverted at that point, uh, he was a good listener. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I told him, told him what happened to me in prison down there and uh, surviving it. In fact, I'm probably the only gringo you'll ever meet that never, that got out of prison without paying a dime. <laughs> I heard that in your in your story. That is amazing. <laughs> that's, a, that's a long story. You know, yeah. The whole prison. If you've I, ever seen Midnight Express, it's yeah. pretty much like that. But God. Worse. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> worse. <laughs> worse. Wow. That's scary. One toilet in the whole one toilet in the whole prison. Oh my God. And if you got, were lucky enough to get to go to the toilet, there were crabs on it the size of baby sea crabs. Uh, I'm talking about lice. Oh, oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> Oh my God! Most of the time, we'd have to shit through the bars and clean it up with our toothbrushes. Oh my God! Uh, it was it was horrendous. Yeah, but, sounds horrendous. Uh, the ironies are are multiple, and anyway, I was in Puerto Vallarta recuperating from that experience, and and Neil shows up in the middle of the night, <laughs> as he was used, as he would do. <laughs> yeah, he never called ahead to say I'm coming. <laughs> yeah. He just arrived. Yeah, and uh, and and so you know when he decided to go into the jungle, which was part of your question about that. Yeah, um, we were in a cafe, uh, you know, with this hooker, and and um, suddenly at dusk, late dusk, he says, "I'm going to go for a walk in the jungle." Well, back then, Puerto Vallarta was just a fishing village. The the uh, the gringos hadn't discovered it yet. <laughs> yeah, we say. Yeah, yeah. The night of, night of the iguana had been filmed the year before on that location. Okay. Uh, one of my ten, favorite Tennessee Williams movies. I haven't seen that. Um, oh, it's great, Night of the Iguana. You gotta see, it. rent it, man. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Great, great movie. Yeah, I'm writing that down. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, long story short, um, Neil said I gotta go for a walk in the jungle, and I said, "Are you crazy, man?" There's anacondas out there. There's jaguars, there's, you know, smugglers and baby fuckers and God knows what else out there in the jungle. You don't go there at night, man. Yeah. You know, it's completely untamed. Yeah. So all I had on me was a flashlight. And I said, well, you better take this with you if you're insisting on going. But I don't think you should do this, Neil. But he, he wanted to go. Well, in the middle of the night, there was automatic gunfire in the jungle and the proprietor of the place that we were in said well it happens all the time it's hunters or whatever blah blah but that's where the bullet holes came from in, in his body so it's a mystery as to who was behind it I, my guess my intuition tells me Merlin's intuition tells me yeah that he he basically probably tried to do his cop rap he used to call it his cop rap hmm when when Keith, when when Ken when Neil Cassidy and Ken and the rest of those guys went across the country, Neil was the bus driver, right? Yeah. And so in every state, they'd get stopped by the cops, wondering what the fuck this is. I bet. I bet. <laughs> and Cassidy, being a, a blue collar, you know, working man's hero, not like the rest of us, he looked very like a truck driver. Or, yeah. You know, like, you know. <laughs> He'd go out there and start joking with the cops, and they'd be guffawing and ha patting each other on the shoulder. And they'd inevitably ask him, "Who are those freaks hanging out those windows?" <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. And Neil would always say, "Well, 
they're, they're mental cases that I'm taking back to New York. <laughs> <laughs> so he and played the, the official. Move on. <laughs> <laughs> at work, huh? That actually, at yeah. work? Wow. It was a partial truth. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. Well, that, 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 but, that, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, I mean, it's, it, it, the whole thing is that, that what's behind his death, I don't know. I know that the Federalists covered it up. Which is weird. They didn't want me to see the bullet holes in his chest. And then they cremated him. And, yeah, and Carolyn had asked us to ship his body back. So the next day he was, you know, ashes in a mason jar. I mean, that's obviously a cover-up. Like, there's no... Yeah, there's, I, they, I, in my mind, it's a fact. They covered it up. Whether they were behind the killing, I don't know. Um, I do know this, that the CIA was very scared of Cassidy. Very, they, We really were going to change the world. That's what we were doing, you know? Yeah. And the establishment got very scared of us. Because we had a lot of power, for someone who had no money, and they didn't like that. Well, that that brings so, up my question: of Why did he 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 insisted on going to the jungle where he got shot? It sounds like right. he there was a reason, like he like someone was meeting him, like he like someone lured him out there. He well, if there was, he never gave me any indication of it. It was like a compulsion. It was a very compulsive guy. Yeah, of course, of course. But. I, my my gut instinct is that he got he ran into something illicit going on out there in the middle of the night, and um, he tried his cop rap, which always worked in the U.S. <laughs> now in Mexican federales, man, they don't want to hear shit, you know. Yeah. They're not making they're making a couple of pesos every day. They're you know corrupted and they didn't want to deal with someone like so. They probably just thought he was crazy and and may just have killed him because of that. Which, which is a plausible story, except for the, the weirdness of him insisting on going to the jungle that day. That's what I can't understand. It's just such an well, odd thing. But I had seen things like this earlier in his life, uh, when he decided to go live in a cave in Big Sur uh, <laughs> that you couldn't stand up in. Yeah. He was there for six months, man. Jesus. I never thought, why, why did you do that, man? <laughs> wow. You know? I mean, what, what's going on in that cave? So, it, it, there's a pattern there. Yeah, yeah. Saying. Yeah, I see that. And, and, you know, we always worried about him, but he was always surviving. <laughs> so, the idea of him dying of overexposure yeah, on never... railroad tracks is absolutely in, in right field, you know? Well, I'm glad to see you. Um, I wanted to see you because I couldn't really tell the, that, that other video. So, I wanted to see your face when you said that to know you're telling the truth because you obviously yeah. are. And I mean, well, I'm I'm a dying man, and uh, so yeah, the truth is something you you do when you're at that stage of your life. Amen to that. You know, so it's like um, I leave with this knowledge, and some will believe it, and some won't. And I don't give a fuck. Really. <laughs> yeah. Frankly. Yeah. <laughs> Wow. Like I tell people, I got on the bus, but I also got off the bus and stepped onto a time machine. So, you know. What do you mean, what do you mean by that? What do you... Well, what do you think I mean? Stepped onto a time machine that, I, I don't know what you mean. What do you mean by the time machine? All right, here's, here's what happened. The Pranksters was only one chapter in my journey. Of course. That's all it was. Just a chapter. It was, I was in the right place at the right time with the right chemistry. <laughs> and, you know, and that's that's how it happened. But, you know, the whole life story is, is quite interesting. And now uh, uh, an Oscar winner is doing a movie about my life. A documentary really? feature called Merlin Speaks. Really? Four years in the making, man. Wow. Which, who, which Oscar winner? Who, who's doing it? Oh, can you say it? His name is Kevin Clobber. Okay. Clobber with a C? I want to look it up. K-L-A-U-B-E-R. B-E-R, okay. Well, how, how is so, the project going? Like, has he just been interviewing you for every... We're, we're, we're interviewing survivors, 
interviewing a few ghosts. <laughs> it's a fascinating movie, really. If I stand aside from it, it's like, yeah, it's an interesting story. Yeah, you know? no, it sure is. Um, and he came and found me. I didn't. I didn't solicit this in any way. I just. Uh, Perfectly happy being an old man on my boat, anonymous, you know? <laughs> yeah. Really. Yeah. You know, uh, but he, he came and said, you know, we interviewed Mick Jagger and all the surviving musicians of, of that era, and we were left for want because we were looking for every man. And they said, well, you're it. You're the every man we've been looking for. So. Wow. That's what, what happened. That was started four years ago, and we're almost finished shooting the film. And, uh, uh, in fact, my, my artistic partner and I are going to be doing some Pantozik, P-A-N-T-O-Z-I-Q-U-E. It's the marriage and synchronization of my music and satire. <laughs> I like that. That is awesome. <laughs> wow. It's as if Len Lenny Bruce or, or Richard Pryor were doing mine. The material was <laughs> along those lines. Wow. Wow. So... You know the story. The story began long before the pranksters. It was just yeah. one of those episodes that um, was very significant. Yeah, of course. Well, let me. So, uh, the, 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 I guess the other question, and and you mentioned how the CIA was afraid of Neil. Now, the reason I mentioned what I went through with the the fluoride was, and I mean that's just it, it's not even on cue. It's just every time I think about it, I have to crack. Um. Yeah, <laughs> it's uh, so it's now come out through congressional hearings and such that the CIA was giving people in prison with uh, LSD without their knowledge. Yeah, and, and in the army too. And the army too. Well, that's the the army yeah. is is how I, I kind of correlate what happened to me because it, it it wasn't just random. It wasn't just dentists saying, "Hey, fluoride will be good for him." This was. I was born at Fort Dix on an army hospital, and they gave me something that has affected my entire life. And they, because they were trying chemicals, they were trying all these different chemicals on people. But the, yeah. but what I'm getting to here is Neil's arrest, and then two years in San Quentin corresponds with with when they were doing those experiments at San Quentin. Yes. So the fact that he ended up on a bus with Ken Casey, who's probably the most famous victim slash, I don't even know what the word is for it, because he, it didn't, you know, for Ken Casey, is it really victimhood? Because it, you know, turned out pretty well for him. So, I mean, the, it seems like, and there's, where you say that the pranksters are divided, it seems like, from what I understand, quite a few of the pranksters were CIA were federal agents undercover because they were going around basically spreading it, show up in a town with a thousand hits of LSD, and then next thing you know, all the progressives in the town were crazy people type of thing. Well, it, uh, there's a lot to what you're saying. Um, I, I know that when I toured with the Grateful Dead, um, you know, Jerry, I was one of Jerry Garcia's pet peeves, you know, um, <laughs> because he was a painter as well as a musician and when he saw what I was doing was very visual and it was synchronized with the music. So wow. we, we had a great relationship, but before oftentimes many of those shows, um, these two guys in black would come and lay a pound of Coke on them and say, have a good show. It's on the house, but they were never there for the after parties. Which made me suspicious. Yeah. And a huge part of the infiltration you're talking about was to discredit yeah. our motivations. Of course. Yep. Absolutely. To to make us look like a bunch of freaks and clowns. Yeah. So, uh, you know, that's that's just that's the way it was. Now it's much more sophisticated. Yeah, it sure is. Well, that, that, now in Berkeley, in Berkeley, there was during the sixties there was these guys called Reagan's Long Hairs. <laughs> Reagan was the governor of California at that time. Yeah, and we kidnapped one of those guys. Yeah, and we tied him to a big chair. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God! And 
and interrogated him. And he fell in love with one of our ladies. And so he just spilled the beans. He told us <laughs> that he was working for the, the governor. And He was and working guys, for the governor like it was a... Right? These guys were in the protest movement. And they'd be the first ones to throw the rocks and the bricks. The sheeple would follow in kind. And he, they would go through the police lines, flipping their badges open, and we'd all get smashed to deep smithereens. That's, that was happening back then. It's much more sophisticated now. Yeah, it's, yeah it absolutely is. But that's, that was the prototype. Um, the Cointel Pro and, and Chaos programs. And then Reagan uh, in California was absolutely assisting in that. I can't believe you, you guys took one of those guys, tied him to a chair, and got the truth out of him. That is, that's fantastic. That better be in the movie. That's all in the movie, man. It's oh, all good. In the movie. Good. I was going to say that better be in the movie because that's that's yeah. that's probably the best one of the best parts of this. I'm just blown away. Wow. Well, well, let me give an example. You know, you probably heard about the free store. Yeah. Yeah. The the. You know, uh, um, I forget his name now at the moment. Um, a bit of well-known actor was running the free store at the time. Yeah, yeah. I, I... And, uh, and a, a, a congressman and a senator came to visit the free store uh, to to see what was going on there. And um, they'd see a guy come in and take his shirt off, put it on the pile, and grab a pair of pants and put them on and leave. <laughs> Right. So they say to Peter Coyote, that's who it was. Oh, yeah, they okay. Say to Peter, they say to Peter, you know, uh, this is a business, right? He said, well, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> and they said, well, where's the commerce? He said, what commerce? <laughs> money. Like, well, where's the money part of the business? And, and he said, well, there is none. And those guys literally backed out of that store, <laughs> like didn't want to turn their back on Peter and the rest of them. Yeah, yeah. Because it blew their minds. Yeah. It was like, what do you mean free store? <laughs> I mean, you can see how it, how it how it affects capitalist lovers. Yeah. You know, I mean, the the, the whole system of buying, buying, and buying. You know, um, and so. That was just one of a multitude of things that bothered the establishment. Yeah. To the point where they wanted to do something about it. And they did. Yeah, they sure did. They did do something about it. They sure did. The mock Buddhists became yuppies. They got tired of having no possessions. (laughs) And so they they became business people, right? Yeah. Dig it. (laughs) So what what I'm getting to is back in those days... We didn't call each other hippies. We called each other brothers and sisters. Oh, wow. Right? The yeah. press named us hippies. But there were tr- very few true, authentic hippies. There were those who wanted to be. Yeah. yeah. And tr- did the accoutrement and the <laughs> presentation of that, but they weren't really for real. You know, so a lot of those people and that and the prankster thing was infiltrated by some of that, too, to some degree. Oh, yeah. Like, for instance, Walker comes from a banker family. <laughs> well, that's he comes from capitalism itself. Quite a few people on that bus had some very powerful families they were connected to. Yes. Which yes. is a little, little exactly. weird considering what what it was purporting to be. Right. Right. So, I mean, all of this is coming out in the movie wow. and uh i'll be gone so they can't get me in trouble for it. <laughs> <laughs> so, how long do your doctors I'm, I'm taking advantage how long do your doctors say you have oh they, i told them i'd be dancing on their graves uh yeah they want me to do chemo and radiation and all that and, uh, and I told him, no, no way. Yeah. No damn way. I've lost more friends to chemo than I did the cancer that gave it to him. Yeah. No, I, that's what my fiance so, went through. I mean, she, I swear to God, it's the chemo that killed her. Because yeah. she was in full remission, but the doctors, I, I, by removing cigarettes and bad food and giving her all kinds of healthy foods and supplements and exercise, we got her cancer levels completely down. 
And the doctor said, well, it might come back. You better keep doing chemo. So she kept going right. and getting the chemo. And then right. I swear to God, if she had just. So, yeah, no, you're, you're doing you're doing the best because now you're not throwing up right now. Right. You're, no. you're able to. And, you're... And I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm actually looking to the east for some of my medications. Nice. I'm doing a lot of different mushrooms. Oh, good. Uh, uh, of, uh, of med remedies for cancer yeah um i'm doing a pill that that was uh, invented in south korea uh to deworm dogs and kids okay right yeah and they found out oh it has a 93 percent cancer cure rate wow well so i'm taking those have you heard of the the hoxy the hoxy clinic in mexico yeah i have because i i actually went there and i interviewed people who have who swear it saved their lives I mean, it was, I, 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 I'm convinced because it's done since, since the nurse was forced to take it to Mexico in 1960, they've never advertised once. They're, right. they're, they're fully in business based on word of mouth and who lies right. to a friend that has cancer and says, oh, this thing cured me. I mean, how, there's no way to perpetuate, you know, a, a 50 year business model based on word of mouth if it doesn't work. <laughs> I mean that's just that's just common yeah. sense. Well, that you know, I mean, they have the cures. Yeah. Well, I mean, but every time a doctor gets you on chemo, he gets ten thousand dollars from the from the pharmaceutical companies. Oh yeah, I, I say that that the, the state of California, because Audrey, my Audrey was on Medicare, so all of her treatments were paid for. I I say the state of California spent about a million dollars to not save her. Like, right. and it's just, it's preposterous. You know what they do in China? Hmm. I just found out about this a few months ago, um, that all the citizens of China have to pay a, a nominal fee every month to the medical community to keep them healthy. Hmm. And if they get sick, they no longer have to pay. <laughs> what? What? I've never heard, how could I have never heard... I, hey, I just found out a few months ago. Wow. I'm going to look into that. That, That's, that. that makes common sense, doesn't it? That would, I you mean. them to keep you healthy. Yeah, that, that, wow. that would, that would kind of motivate, that would motivate health <laughs> instead of motivating perpetual chemo. Right. So the doctor said, oh, you're in pain here. Have some Oxycontin or <laughs> have some, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, so I see through the veneer. Um. The Zen colleges called me on the phone literally and said, if you don't do chemo, you'll be dead within six months to a year. And I, I said, doctor, with all due respect, I'll be dancing on your grave. <laughs> and that's and there was a long silence after that. <laughs> so, and look, it's a medical fact that we create our own cancers. Yeah. It does, it's not a foreign substance. It's we through psychology and through our chemistry, create our own cancers. Well, if we create our own cancers, we can uncreate them. Well, that's the thing about the ho the hoxytonic is it it was it's all natural, and the way it was discovered was Harry Hoxie's grandfather would study sick uh, horses, which plants they would go to to cure their own cancer, and then he put those. I mean, he, decades. Like decades of watching the animals. How are these animals curing themselves? And then he, right. he, there's like eight of those plants put together in the hoxytonic. And like I said, I, I mean, I, I've talked to people personally who swear. Like I, my doctor said stage four, I'm never going to make it. And here I am 20 years later. And that's why. And it's, it, right. and the reason you have to go to Mexico for it is because the AMA tried to buy it from Hoxie. And he said, I will sell it to you on the condition that if somebody can't afford it, you will give it to them anyway. And they said, fuck, no. And he said, no. There was actually a tussle. Him and the doctor had like a fight in, in the office over this. And he stormed out. And from that point on, they spent the rest of his life suing him. He went from law. He had cured patients who would follow him from state to state to testify in his trials that, he, that they were cured by him. Until he finally couldn't do it anymore, and then his nurse took it to Mexico, and it's been there since 1960. That doesn't sound like a, a, a charlatan. That sounds like no. somebody who has the truth and is being persecuted for it, right? Right. 
Wow. I'm not surprised. No. Yeah, it's it's heartbreaking because this world could work so much better if it wasn't for bullshit like that. We almost changed the world, brother. Yeah. We almost changed the world. Well, you did. It's yeah. just, it's it was a step. And unfortunately, it's like the Star Wars trilogy. You, 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 you destroyed the Death Star, but then the Empire strikes back. And that's kind of where we're at right now. And we got to wait for the return Absolutely. of the Jedi. You know, one of, the, one of the things that Cassidy arranged was for us to go visit uh, Huxley, Aldous Huxley. Oh, wow. He was dying of cancer. And he was down to like 78 pounds. You know, he was he had a blanket around him and he was uh, tripping on mescaline, psilocybin, and acid. He was a pretty happy guy for a dying man. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> and we're all sitting around feeling bad for him because we're going to lose another great mind, you know? Yeah. The great futurist of our time. Yeah. And and he looks at us and he says, don't worry about me. He says, I'm escaping. <laughs> you have no idea what's coming. Yeah. Then he went into discuss, discussing corporate governments and diseases and stuff that are man-made. And, and, you know, he was, he said, this is what, you, what you're headed for. Yeah. And we all went, holy shit. <laughs> you know, holy shit. And, and he was dead a couple of months later. But and then everything came true. That. Yeah. <laughs> wow. We talking about viruses. I mean, it was amazing. I mean, he saw it all. Yeah. But not enough people were listening. Part of it is that, and part of it is what you can you do. Like, I mean, if I tell everyone I know these truths that we're discussing, does it change anything? Like, I mean, unfortunately, the system is so well entrenched that it. It. I mean, I I don't know. I don't know how to, I don't know. <laughs> well, I mean, it's a, it's a collective thing that we have to do. Yeah, yeah. And I, 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 Gil Scott Heron had a famous line, each one reach one, each one try to teach one. And that, right. I, I, I love that philosophy because you can't try to do too much. Seth, Seth I spent my life doing that. <laughs> Nice. Educating without a single word spoken nice. in a universal language. Yeah. And in the name of high entertainment. <laughs> oh, ha, ha, ha. Ooh, that's depressing. Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, it was a, it was an incredible mission. Yeah. To be on. And and you're right. And the the best way to teach is subliminally. Yeah. If you, I mean, when I when I meet. These Trumpers, these guys who are Trump followers, yeah, you know, I ask them a question like this: Well, would you allow him to babysit your children? Exactly. <laughs> I don't get into it politically. I just say, would you trust that man to take care of your kids? Yeah. What do they say? Well, they almost ninety nine point nine percent of them say no. Of <laughs> and and then they go off to say how the other guy is the creep. That's my favorite right. thing: is the Trump people say Biden's a creep, the Biden people say Trump's a creep. When they're both creeps. Like, there's no... <laughs> right? There's no... You know what Will Rogers said in 1950-something? Hmm. He said... You know who he was, right? Yeah, yeah. Will Rogers? Yeah. He's, he's the cowboy philosopher, they call him. Yeah, yeah. Um, he said, yeah, America's a two-wing party system, two right wings, and we're flying in circles. Sure makes me dizzy. Uh, that's the truth. That that could have been written yesterday. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Or tomorrow. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> wow. So he was so popular that there was a movement to make him president. And he said, "No, no, no, no." He says, "I like my old job. Besides, I had this thing for the truth." <laughs> nice. <laughs> There's a very hip dude. Yeah. Well, he look, was it's one the... Of the original pranksters, really. Yeah. You know. Wow. And so, so we we have to educate each other. We have to unite. We have to see through the veneer of the internet. Because uh, when I was a kid, it was before your time. But when I was a kid, people would say, "I know it's right. I I read it in the book." <laughs> and now that's what they say about the internet. Google told me, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. Wikipedia told me Neil Cassidy died on the railroad tracks. Yeah, I literally every, every that's what I believed right up until last night when I watched your video. Never even questioned it. Like I didn't even know there was a controversy. 
I just wanted to know. I felt like he, I just always kind of felt like that poor, like dying alone next to railroad tracks just seemed like such a tragic end. But if he was lured, exactly. But being lured into the jungle and, and assassinated sounds more like his appropriate, like, I mean, it, it sounds like an ending that makes more sense. I, I knew Lenny Bruce. I mean, I opened for him, and he changed my life, actually. Oh, wow. At the Fillmore. Wow. And it, and Lenny Lenny would say the same thing. He would say, look, man, they're crucifying me with my own words. Yeah. They're quoting me out of context. They're killing me with my own words. And he, he told me that what I did was really important to the movement because it's interpretive, fool. <laughs> And it's a universal language. Holy shit. Yeah. They couldn't drag me through the courts. Were they going to quote a mine? <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to see that transcript. <laughs> oh, <That's>... man. <laughs> ah, so I got in a lot of trouble anyway, but they couldn't drag me through the courts. Wow. But he's the one who changed my, my mindset. He's the one who basically birthed the satirist in me. Wow. That I saw the world through satirical perspective. Well, let me ask, do you think he killed himself or do you think... No, I know he didn't. I met the two guys that killed him. What? That's, uh, that's in the movie. Holy fucking shit. It was CIA. They overdosed him. He, he he was always very careful about the amount of drugs he used. So, but the idea that he was just so depressed because he couldn't work? He was depressed because they were dragging his ass to the courts every fucking day and arresting him on stage. But I mean, the, he just... They were scared of him, Seth. <sighs> Look what's happening to comedians today. Well, let me... Holy shit. Let me... Let me uh, and I, there's, I'm going to just give you a real quick, short version of what... The reason that I'm in the situation I'm in right now. I, uh... Because... It, it, what I'm going to say, most people I just assume it's crazy, but you sound like you're going to actually believe me. I... It, 20 years ago, when 9-11 happened... There was some girl at work who said George Bush did it. And I'm like, no, that's stupid, the craziest thing I ever heard. And then I started doing research. About a year later, I had a website that proved, and I used I just meticulous, because I, I was a journalist. Like, I, I was the editor-in-chief of my college newspaper. Journalism is, my like, my core, one of my core arts. And I proved that 9-11 was an inside job. And for the 20 years since, my life has been a living hell. They have forced my last 11 employers to fire me. Federal agents have... The, 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 there's only two precious things in my life. Well, four now. But my, my Audrey had two kids, which I unofficially adopted when she died, before she died. But my her daughter, our daughter now, is mentally disabled. She has multiple personality disorder. And since Audrey died, they have raped this poor girl multiple times. And not just for the sake of raping her, they make sure I know they raped her. And my theory is they have spent the last at least 16 years trying to turn me into a terrorist. Because they have put me on their terrorist watch list and now... If I don't do anything because I'm a peace loving, per like I'm the most peace, I, like I'm, I'm growing one little pot plant with, and, and as I was peeling parts of it off yesterday, I felt bad that I'm hurting the plant. That's who I am. But they're, they, they're positive that if they just push me hard enough, I will do something to justify this. And now, I mean, my, I was fired I won't even get into it because the stories get crazier and crazier. But I, I'm about to be... No, I, I get the gist of what you're talking about. I'm about to be evicted from my apartment because they won't let me work. My family doesn't believe me because how... I mean, 
Who are you? Is what they keep saying. Why would they do this to you? And right, you're not important enough. It, right? That's the that's a, that's the phrase they use. Seth, you're not important enough. You must be a ma and I have. If you look at my YouTube video, I have just in the folder of co covering this subject. I have 255 videos. She had one one boyfriend who and, and they hypnotize her like. They've been drugging and hypnotizing her, and they manipulate her personalities just to torture me. Like, she will, I mean, I can't go into 16 years of hell, but this has been my life. So, when you say something, hey, Seth? yeah, Seth. yeah, uh, my, my director's calling me, I'll call you back. Okay, okay. Holy shit.